Good evening, folks. Uh, welcome to this presentation uh, of Mr. Durant, presented by Russell Doré. Um, Mr. Doré is a board member of the Motor Cities National Heritage Area, a member of the Henry Ford Heritage Association and the Northville Historical Society. He holds a bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees in social sciences. He is quite well capable of these presentations and quite good at it. So we hope you enjoy the evening and I am going to turn you over to Mr. Doré. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be back with you folks at the Highland Activity Center. Uh, this is our virtual meeting, uh, but uh, I think we're going to have uh, as much fun as we do in person, I hope. Before we uh, get into Billy Durant and, and leading into Billy Durant, I'd like you to think about how um, startling these new horseless carriages were when these pioneers started their companies because it was all horse and buggy then and, and it, was a, it was a big transition. And so to do that I'd like to share with you uh, something written by a teenage girl about her first ride in an automobile uh, which was a pannard. And it goes like this. I saw the pannard coming up the hill to get me. It was bright yellow paint. As I looked, I saw the whole car was trembling as if it had palsy. I suppose the mechanic who drove it was afraid to shut it off. It roared to a fine lusty sound like a big beast held in leash. My schoolmate and I had to talk in shrieks to make ourselves heard. Get in, she waved her hand and I climbed in. There came a staccato clank of gears. The chain beneath our feet rattled. The car sprang to life, nearly jerking our heads from our shoulders and we were off. My schoolmate and I clutched each other. It was terrible and delicious all at the same time. When we swooped downhill at about 30 miles an hour, it felt like the dive of a roller coaster. Pedestrians paused and watched us pass, heads stuck out of windows. Mothers called to their children to come and look. At least I gather they did from the waving of arms and the running of children. Each time we overtook a horse was an adventure. The horses the reared, horses tried to run weird. away, and showed every sign of terror. Once the pandemonium of our progress was so great that a team of fine horses began to jump and lunge in their harness long before we reached them. Our driver slowed the car to let the team pass on to the next crossing. At this moment, our engine stopped. The engine refused to start. A crowd began to collect. My schoolmate and I sat huddled and humiliated in the back seat while the driver crawled underneath and did mysterious things to our mechanism. Get a horse! The crowd grinned at the derisive cry of a small urchin. But early motorists did not hear those fateful words. One man took them as a serious reminder. Tow you home, ladies, he suggested respectfully. The crowd tittered. We both blushed under our veils. An explosion, a prolonged roar. This time it was sweet music. The crowd scattered in fright. We sat up a little straighter. Our yellow dragon had come to life again. We sped away, leaving our tormentors in a cloud of dust to debate the miracle of the horseless carriage against the mentality of the fools who believed they'd ever amount to anything. Well, I could hardly wait to tell my father the great news. Pops, I've ridden in a horseless carriage. He made me say it twice. And then with deep emotion, he made the priceless retort which for all these years I've treasured. He, William C. Durant, the man who is presently to do more than any other living man to sell the United States on the idea of an automobile as a man's of, of, means of transportation. He who was to make his creed a motor for every family. He who in a few short years was to form the greatest merger the automobile industry has ever known said, Marjorie, how could you? How could you be so foolish? to risk your life in one of those things. Well, this was written by Marjorie Durant in her book, My Father, published in 1929 about her first ride earlier in a car. So how did Billy Durant go from this skeptical attitude to being an automotive entrepreneur in just two years? So that's what we're going to hear about. Well, Billy Durant was an entrepreneur, not a builder of cars but rather a builder of companies, a dreamer who put several automobile companies together. 
into what became the world's largest corporation. It's hard to believe that this man who at one time was worth millions died penniless. Surprising to many to learn that he nearly acquired the Ford Motor Company on two different occasions. So let's explore the life of this somewhat unknown icon of the American industry. William Crapo Durant was born December 8, 1861 in Boston. He had an older sister, Rosie. His father, William Clark Durant, was an unsuccessful land and stock speculator and an alcoholic. His mother, Rebecca Crapo, was a daughter of Henry Howland Crapo, a very successful lumber baron in Flint, Michigan, who was elected mayor of Flint, then Republican state senator, and finally governor of Michigan. When Willie, as he was known, was seven, his father left the family and his mother moved from Boston to Flint to be near her parents. Willie was close to his mother all his life. There's Henry Howland Crapo. Billy, as he was now known, dropped out of school at age 16, six months short of graduation. He got a job at the Crapo Foundry started by his grandfather. He took a second job selling cigars door to door, sold more than three other agents combined. So the owner let them go, gave their ter ter territories to Billy. Billy had a love of playing checkers with his customers. Billy was the consummate salesman. Years later, Walter Chrysler said of him, I cannot hope to find words to express the charm of the man. He has the most winning personality of anyone I've known. He could coax a bird right down out of a tree. At age 20, Billy was asked to turn around the local waterworks, which he did in eight months, established a local insurance agency, and made enough money to buy a house. 1885, he married Clara Pitt, daughter of the Flint and Pier Marquette Railroad's local ticket master. They had a daughter, Marjorie, who wrote the little article we just read, and Son Cliff in, 19, or in 1890. Well, Billy bought a horse cart company for $2,000 that he borrowed. And his friend Dallas Dort bought a half interest from him for $1,000. So Billy had $1,000 of borrowed money invested. It was called the Flint Horse Cart Company. And all they got was two completed horse carts and a design patent. Billy immediately took one cart to a show in Wisconsin and won a blue ribbon. He got 100 orders there. He stopped in Milwaukee, got 35 more, went to Chicago, got 465 more, came home with a total of 600 orders. So he and his partner had not built a single cart, nor did they have a plant in which to build them. Well, they arranged for production with a local company and sold 4,000 the first year. But the owner convinced the major dealer in Chicago to buy directly from him. So they bought a building, changed the name to Durant Dort Carriage Company and built them themselves. A key was that they manufactured all their own components instead of buying them uh, like other manufacturers did and this kept their costs down. They built a variety of carriages from small racing carts to larger passenger coaches. He set up a national network of franchise dealers and by 1900, Durant Dort was the largest vehicle manufacturer in the US. Vehicles, of course, being horses and buggies, horse and buggies. They built a headquarters building in Flint, which is now a small museum. Across the street is their first plant, now renovated by GM. It holds the Kettering University Automotive Archives, and it is called Factory One. So Billy Durant, not yet 40, was a millionaire whom they called King of the Carriage Makers. So now to continue, we need to shift to the automobile industry to learn about the companies that Billy eventually bought. I imagine uh, there's some uh, Buick owners out there or former Buick owners that want to know about the origin of Buick, right? Well, David Buick was born in 1854 in Scotland. 
At age 15, he went to work for the Alexander Manufacturing Company in Detroit. They produced toilet bowls and water closets. He and William Sherwood bought the company after it folded in 1882 and renamed it Buick and Sherwood Company. Well, he sold his interest to Sherwood and he started the Buick Manufacturing Company with investors and a small amount of equity in 1902 to develop his own automobile. This is the first Buick test driven by Walter Meyer and his son, Tom Buick, July in 1904. Well, he couldn't maintain the equity that he had agreed to and his investors now owned the company. They only built 37 cars in 1904. So we're gonna leave David Buick and come back when Billy gets involved. Uh, I'm sure there's some old owners out there, aren't there? Aren't you? I hope you wanna know about the history of Oldsmobile. You're gonna find out anyway. <clears throat> Ransom E. Olds was born in 1864 in Ohio. He moved to Lansing where his father set up a machine shop. Ranny, as he was known, uh, built his first horseless carriage in 1887 at age 23. His father retired and Ranny built a factory in Lansing, the first plant in America for the exclusive manufacture of automobiles. He got some investors and built a larger plant in Detroit. They called it the Olds Motor Works. They built 11 different models, but none sold too well. He then developed a small and dependable and affordable car, the Curve Dash Ozenbiel, the first volume car produced in America. The Detroit plant burned and instead of rebuilding in Detroit, he built a new plant in Lansing. They sold 4,000 Curve Dash automobiles for $650 each in 1903. That year rings a bell. That is year, the year that the presently existing Ford Motor Company was founded by Henry Ford, his third try. But that's a whole nother story. Olds used a version of an assembly line where the parts were laid out on the floor and the workers moved down the line. Well, Ransom E. Olds had a falling out with his financial backer, Fred Smith, and the Olds management team. So he left Oldsmobile and formed Rio using his initials, R-E-O. Fred Smith then ran Oldsmobile. By 1908, Rio was out selling Oldsmobile, and Oldsmobile was in trouble. Again, we're going to leave this and pick it up when Billy gets involved. Uh, imagine there's some Cadillac owners out there that would like to know about the origin of Cadillac. Well, Henry Leland was born in 1843 in Vermont. He was an apprentice machinist at age 16 in Massachusetts. He was a machinist for Brown and Sharp, the leading tool maker in the U.S., and given sales responsibility for all business west of Pittsburgh. He opened a machine shop in Detroit in 1890. His son Wilford trained machinists, including a fellow named Horace Dodge. The Dodge brothers then built engines for the Curve Dash Oldsmobile. Well, Henry Leland built a new engine, a 10.25 horsepower engine, rather than the current three horsepower Olds Company uh, engine was using. But they rejected it due to cost. They didn't want to retool the plant and redesign the chassis for this bigger engine. Meanwhile, the Henry Ford Company, which was uh, Henry's uh, uh, second com com company, let Henry Ford go. They felt he was too involved in racing and not enough in developing passenger automobiles. So they paid Ford $900 for his body design and sent him packing. Well, now they had a problem though. They had a Henry Ford company and they had no Henry Ford. Well, they were gonna close it down and they hired Henry Leland to appraise the plant equipment and see how much it was worth. He looked around, he said, you know, you got some pretty good uh, designs here and pretty good equipment. I think we can make this go. So they asked him to stay on and save the company. So he named it, of course, again, it was called the Henry Ford Company. He needed a new name, and he named it after the um, explorer who settled Detroit, Cadillac. Well, 1908, Cadillac won the prestigious Dewar Trophy for manufacturing excellence from the Royal Automobile Club of London, which gave them a lot of good publicity. Well, now let's go back and, and see what Billy's up to. He got into the automobile business more by accident than by plan. 
Flint had adopted the name Vehicle City because it was a leading manufacturer city for vehicles or carriages in the country. When, the, when Buick was started, they knew that the automobile was going to replace the horseless carriage, so they envisioned it, uh, Flint continuing to be Vehicle City. Well, then when Buick started to falter, uh, the Flint people got concerned. So James Whiting of Flint Wagon Works bought Buick to save it from financial ruin and help the city of Flint. He needed somebody to manage it. So he went to Billy Durant. And he loaned Billy, uh, Billy a 1904 Buick 20 owned by a friend. Billy wasn't interested at first. And uh, James Whiting said, well, just, just drive this car for a month or two and come on back and let's talk. He kind of thought he might fall in love with it. Well, for two months, Durant drove it over all kinds of roads and hazards. I don't know if this is a Buick, but this kind of shows the uh, road conditions in those days. Uh, it's being pulled out by a horse. The road conditions uh, haven't changed much here in Michigan since those days. Um, but he was so impressed that he took over the management of Buick in 1904. Being the consummate salesman, he exhibited a Buick at the 1905 automobile show himself. He returned home with 1,108 orders. The Durant Dort Company bought a third of the shares in Buick, and the investors bought the rest to raise a half million dollars. They used a vacant Durant Dort plant in Jackson, Michigan to fill the first orders. Then they built a new plant in Flint. Billy set up a national network of 13 Buick distributors in 1905. One interesting one was Charles Howard, who was a bicycle dealer in San Francisco he became a distributor for eight Western states, became very wealthy, and later owned racehorses. One of them was Seabiscuit, that won the Horse of the Year Award in 1938. Well, Billy provided $100,000 to a fellow named Charlie Mott to build an axle plant next to the new Buick plant. This was actually the beginning of vertical integration and just-in-time parts delivery. Well, Durant bought David Buick's last share of stock in the company for $100,000. Unfortunately, David Buick lost it in a series of bad investments and died in 1929 in the charity ward at Harper Hospital in Detroit. So at the start of 1908, Buick was number one in sales, but it was overtaken by Ford once the Model T came out. So the origin of GM actually started at a meeting Durant held in his room at the original Pontchartrain Hotel in Detroit, shown here, which has been uh, demolished and replaced since. The meeting was with Henry Ford, Ransom Oles, now who owned Rio, a fellow named Ben Briscoe of the Maxwell Briscoe Company. The idea was to merge their four companies into a single enterprise. Briscoe had previously been an investor in Buick. Well, this was being put together by the J.P. Morgan Company, they had suggested to Briscoe that they do this like they had done to form U.S. Steel by merging several companies. At that time, there were 423 companies in the U.S. organized specifically to manufacture automobiles. Briscoe wanted to bring in the top 20 com companies. Durant said, let's keep it a little more simple and just uh, start with the four of us. Well, the meeting was actually scheduled at the Penobscot building, but the four owners arrived with a cadre of associates and advisors. Durant felt this would create too much attention in the press. Quietly asked each of the other three to meet him in a room he kept at the Pontchartrain Hotel. Well, after several more meetings, Henry Ford wanted in, but he wanted $3 million in cash plus stock in the new company. Ransom Olds learned that Ford wanted cash. He wanted cash, too. Well, it wasn't possible for Durant to come up with the cash. He had been buying a lot of uh, companies, uh, small companies. Some made it and some didn't. And I think the board just said, let's pass on this, uh, on this deal. Uh, it just, uh, we don't need this right now. And um, so he couldn't come up with the cash. So, uh, but if he would have, uh, Ford Motor Company would have been a division of General Motors. Well, Durant had a plan B, took a night train to Lansing called Fred Smith of the Olds Motor Works at home at midnight. He knew Olds was losing money. So at 3 a.m., he toured the plant. Durant proposed a holding company, General Motors, which would include Buick and Olds. 
Smith agreed to a stock exchange and General Motors was incorporated September 16th, 1908. They really didn't announce it to the press until December. Well, what was happening in Billy's life? During his hectic entrepreneurial activity, Billy's personal life was changing. Two years earlier, he had been introduced by his daughter to a 19-year-old friend of hers, Catherine Laterer. Well, Billy left his wife, Clara, and asked Catherine's mother if he could see Catherine socially. Well, since he was still technically married, she said no. Didn't stop Billy, he hired Catherine as a secretary. Clara put herself in a rest home in North Carolina and filed for divorce. Divorce was filed two years later on May 27, 1908. The very next day, he married Catherine Later. She was 20, he was 46. Clara moved to California with her 19-year-old son Clifford and never saw Billy again. Billy's son Clifford became a race driver and California playboy with no steady job and was described as having a more than ample girth. He died of a heart attack in 1937, 10 years before his father. Billy's daughter Marjorie, who wrote the little article we read, married Billy's doctor, Edwin Campbell. He eventually left his medical practice and became a key executive in General Motors. Campbell and Marjorie were later divorced. She went through two more divorces. Unfortunately, she and her fourth husband were arrested for drug dealing in 1947 and reportedly were drug addicts. Now, uh, how about Pontiac? Some of you out there, uh, I'm sure, were Pontiac owners. Uh, that's I learned to drive on a 1937 Pontiac. I'm not that old, but uh, uh, we didn't have a very new family car. It had a stick shift, a very long stick shift that came all the way up from the floorboards to where you shifted. Uh, so that was uh, uh, Pontiac was my very first uh, learning car. Billy's next acquisition then was the Oakland Motor Company. It was founded by Edward Murphy in 1907, headquartered in Pontiac, Michigan. The first car, the Model K, won a hill climbing championship in 1907. They sold only 278 automobiles in 1908. Durant bought it for a song in January of 1909. They later added a Pontiac model, which outsold the Oakland, so they changed the name of the company to Pontiac or the brand name to Pontiac. Well, Billy started looking at his acquisitions now, and uh, he thought Oldsmobile had great brand recognition, partly because of the song, In My Merry Oldsmobile. Well, Durant found that Olds was run by men more concerned with near-term profits than by high-quality cars. The new mid-size six-cylinder was not competitive, too expensive for its size. So Durant went to the Olds plant brought in a Buick 10. He had them take off the wooden body, the chassis were wooden in those days, place it on sawhorses. He had them cut it in half lengthwise, widen it out six inches, uh, cut it uh, crosswise, uh, pull it out six inches uh, in that direction. And he said, we'll make a car a little wider and a little longer than this Buick. And there's your Oldsmobile for the coming year. He said later, I do not know of an automobile ever created in such a short space of time and at as low a cost as the publicly accepted Oldsmobile, small Oldsmobile. So the Buick Model 10 was selling for $1,000 and this new slightly larger Model 20 was put on the market at 1250 and they couldn't build them fast enough. In 1909, its first year, they sold 6,500 units, gave Olds its first profitable year since 1906. Well, the next company Durant bought was Cadillac in 1909. Had a great product, not being managed profitably, and was available at a bargain. GM got its entire purchase price back in a little over a year. In 1912, Cadillac introduced the electric self-starter, a big advantage over the hand crank competition. Uh, for example, many, most women drove electric cars in those days because uh, they, they either couldn't crank the car or they didn't want to because it could uh, reverse and uh, break your wrist. And so uh, um, the, the um, electric starter was a, was a big sales uh, advantage and uh, a very uh, popular with, with women drivers. Uh, well, 
Durant tried to buy Ford again in 1908. Henry said, fine, I want two million upfront cash as part of an overall offer of eight million. And again, uh, he went to the board and I think uh, the board said, well, let, let's pass on this Ford thing. This is probably will never amount to much. So, uh, but again, it would have been a division of General Motors. He also bought several suppliers, including AC spark plug. How about GMC owners? Anybody uh, own a Jimmy? Well, isn't that a beauty? This is uh, one of the uh, product or one of the original uh, parts of GMC. He bought Reliance Truck Company of Lansing and Rapid Motor Company of Pontiac and one other company and combined them into GMC Truck. How about Canadians? Do we have any people with Canadian heritage out there? Well, he added McLaughlin Motor Company in Ontario, Canada, which later became General Motors of Canada. Now, you see the McLaughlin logo on the radiator, but if you look right at the top of the radiator, it says Buick. Uh, they evidently at first just shipped the Buicks over there and put a McLaughlin uh, on it and made it a, a Canadian car. Well, by the fall of 1910, GM had 14,000 employees and was worth $54 million. Durant had paid only $33 million and less than $7 million in cash. All of Billy's purchases weren't successful. Did you ever hear of the Carter? How about the Elmore? These were two examples of brands that didn't work out, but uh, he certainly uh, bought brands that did work out. Well, 1910, big problems arose. The market for large cars dried up. People were flocking to Henry Ford's reliable and inexpensive Model T, his only model. GM, meanwhile, offered 21 different models of larger cars produced by 10 independent divisions, few of which were profitable. Billy Durant's image went from genius to foolish speculator. In order to borrow money to keep GM afloat, a syndicate of 22 banks set up a new structure. Management would be in the hands of a five-man directorate for five years, and Billy was now only one of five and had to step down as president with one vote. One of the bankers, William Starro, became president for the next two years. Charlie Nash, a longtime employee of the Durant Dort Carriage Company, had been brought in by Durant to Buick as president in 1910. This photo shows him at his desk at Buick. So after two years, in 1912, after Durant, two years after he was ousted, Nash was promoted to president of GM. He brought in some more talent. He recruited a young fellow named Walter Chrysler to be works manager for Buick. When Chrysler told his uh, railroad employer that uh, he was going to come to Detroit for a job in the automotive industry, which intrigued him, uh, they said, what are they going to pay you? And he said, uh, $6,000, same as I'm making here. And they said, we want you to stay. Management talent is very scarce and uh, we'll double your salary to $12,000 said, no thanks. He said, I think I'm probably as far as I can go in this industry. I want to get in on the bottom floor of a new industry. Uh, as we'll see, it worked out very, very well for him. After three successful years at Buick, Chrysler asked for $25,000 a year. Remember, he came in at $6,000 and he got it. He also told him he wanted $50,000 the next year and got it. Billy Durant, again, knew manufacturing talent was scarce and he wasn't afraid to pay for it. And Walter wasn't afraid to ask for it. Walter liked sports, supported the Buick soccer team. He, Walter's here in the suit. Somebody might say, uh, why soccer? Why not, uh, why not baseball? Uh, well, David Buick was British, and so they had a soccer team. How about Chevrolet? I'm sure some of you um, were Chevrolet owners. That was our, my second car I drove when I was young, and it was our family car. This is one of my favorite pictures, Louis Chevrolet. Louis Chevrolet was born in Switzerland in 1878 and grew up in France. He and his brother Arthur were race car drivers and mechanics. He beat Barney Oldfield three times in 1905. So he and his brother Arthur went to Durant, asked to be on his Buick race team. Durant said, well, let's set up a race and I want to watch you guys race. So he did. Well, uh, Arthur was a little too uh, cautious, didn't take any chances, so he hired him to be his chauffeur. 
Louis was kind of a wild man, so he hired him to be a driver. Well, Buick Racers won half of all races in the U.S. between 1908 and 1911. Louis took risks no other drivers dared. Now, this may not be a, 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 a Buick, but uh, the chief mechanics often rode with the drivers. Uh, if something broke down, they'd get out during the race and fix it, or they'd adjust the carburetor or something. But unfortunately, uh, four of Louis' mechanics died in accidents during races. Well, Louis left the Buick team to be a free agent in 1909, but he was interested in starting a car company. Well, Billy had seen the potential for a small, low-priced car such as Henry Ford had developed, but he never could convince the board of directors to finance it. So once he'd been pushed out of active GM management, he decided to pursue this on his own. So he incorporated Chevrolet Motor Company in 1911 using Louis's name. Now remember, he's still on the directorate at uh, GM, but they didn't worry about those things in those days, conflict of interest. He uh, gave uh, Louis 100 shares of stock, but no money. Their first plant was in Detroit, and Billy actually moved uh, there in 1912, and so he lived in, in Detroit for a while. Well, they launched two models in 1914. They had advantages over the Model T, such as self-starter, they had a valve and head engine, electric headlights. So they drew many potential Model T buyers because of these advantages. Chevrolet sold very well. 1916, Billy formed another company on his own, United Motors. This was a collection of parts suppliers, included Hyatt Roller Bearings, New Departure, a horn and bearing manufacturer, Dayton Engineering, or Delco, as it was known. They made self-starters, Ramey Electric, Electric Components Company. Duran asked 41-year-old Alfred Sloan of Hyatt to serve as president of United Motors, and we'll hear more about him later. Well, the Delco acquisition brought in Charles Kettering, the inventor of the self-starter, and he would later head up all of GM's research. He's the tall fellow on the right. Kettering had developed the electric motor for the first electric cash register for National Cash Register Company, and then Henry Leland had funded his company to develop the self-starter. When Cadillac had introduced his first electric self-starter in 1912, they won a second Dewar Trophy. No company ever won a second Dewar Trophy. And this is a picture of Sloan and Kettering reviewing the earlier self-starter. Durant also had earlier formed the AC Spark Plug Company with Albert Champion. And later that was merged into Delco to become AC Delco. Well, Durant had kept his shares of GM stock and uh, continued to purchase more. In 1915, he also offered to trade GM stockholders five shares of Chevrolet stock for each GM share. They took them up on it in a big way. So at a GM board meeting in 1916, Durant gets up and announces that Chevrolet now has controlling interest of General Motors. So in June of 1916, Billy Durant was again elected president of GM with the strong support of Pierre Dupont who'd become a major stockholder in GM. Billy was living in New York City and chose not to move back to Detroit or Flint. Well, again, Billy starts looking over his acquisitions, and in 1917, he fired Henry Leland and his son Wilford at Cadillac because they didn't focus enough on sales. Well, as you may know, the Lelands then formed the Lincoln Motor Car Company, which eventually went bankrupt and was bought by Henry Ford in 1922 at auction. Charlie Nash, who had been replaced by Duran as GM president, needed a job, so he took over the Thomas Jeffrey Company in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and named it after himself. Charlie Motors. I'm just seeing if you're following me. Walter Chrysler planned to join Nash, submitted his resignation to GM. Again, Billy valued talent. So he took the night train to Flint, showed up in his office, and offered him $500,000 a year to stay as president of Buick for at least three more years. He accepted with the provision that he had full authority and that Durant would not go directly to anyone but him with any decisions. Well, Billy was a good delegator, but then sometimes he would uh, second guess the people he had delegated to. Walter didn't care for that. So he left in 1919 at the end of his three years 
with $10 million from the sale of his GM stock to Durant. And of course, he later formed the Chrysler Corporation in 1925. Well, during 1917, this country had entered World War I, causing uncertainty in the stock market. GM stock dropped from $200 a share to $75. Billy personally bought GM stock to stabilize the price. He bought it on margin, which meant he was essentially borrowing 90% of the value. When the stock dropped below his purchase price, brokers called his stock and he couldn't pay the remainder. Pierre Dupont became concerned about GM. His company had a lot of cash from wartime sales of explosives, TNT, and chemicals, and bought large shares of stock in GM and Chevrolet to save Durant. In return, Billy had to move Chevrolet and United Motors into GM. In 1919, GM bought controlling interest in Fisher Body. It also went on a big expansion program in every operating unit. It also founded General Motors Acceptance Corporation, the first company to set up finance, set up to finance only automobiles, gave a strong competitive advantage to their dealers. Well, the board at General Motors began construction on the largest office building in the world for its new, new uh, GM headquarters on West Grand Boulevard in Detroit. This wasn't really Billy's idea, but the uh, GM board felt that the company was growing and would need it. But Billy himself was now personally overseeing more than 70 factories in 40 cities in the U.S. alone, with 50 operating executives reporting directly to him. Well, in 1920, the post-war boom ended, and stocks lost 25% of their value, employment dropped by 25%, half a million farmers lost their homesteads, and 100,000 businesses went bankrupt. We all know about the crash, crash of 29, but not so much about this crash of 1920. Well, Billy began secretly buying stock on margin again when he had been clearly told not to. He felt personally responsible for the thousands of stockholders who had entrusted him with the fate of their funds and being the eternal salesman, he felt that the stock would rebound in time. But once again, his margin calls exceeded his cash. He had a fortune in excess of $90 million. Six months later, it was all gone. Well, Pierre Dupont felt that Billy went under the publicity would further weaken GM. He, they bailed him out again to the tune of 30 million, but with a provision that he resigned completely now from GM, which he did. So Billy Durant resigned from GM for the last time in 1920, one week short of his 59th birthday. They did complete the GM building uh, but Billy never occupied an office in the new GM building, even though the initial D can be seen at the top of each corner of the building. This was some building. Uh, this photo was in 1921. The building was completed in 23 and renamed the General Motors building. Had 31 elevators, 19 bowling alleys, nine auto showrooms, two swimming pools, and a partridge in a pear tree. The Durant D can be seen in this crest up on the corner of the building, and it's still there. Well, once again, Billy was down but not out. Within a month of leaving GM without any money, in 1920, he drummed up $5 million through issuing stock in a new company, Durant Motors. By 1923, Durant Motors was fading due to startup costs. It hung on until 1933 when bankruptcy was declared. So Billy's interest shifted back to the stock market. He created investment pools, much like today's mutual funds, with high profile acquaintances, including Joseph P. Kennedy, father of John F. Kennedy. Pools he was involved with had a total of four billion in assets. He was known unofficially as King of the Bulls on Wall Street. Stock market crash though of 1929 wiped him out again. He managed to avoid bankruptcy until 1936. Well, his next venture was to open a bowling alley in one of the country's first drive-in hamburger restaurants in Flint. His North Flint Recreation Center bowling alley opened in 1940. He envisioned a national chain of 50 such centers. I met a fellow once, uh, I was giving a presentation, he came up to me and he said, um, when I was a kid, I bowled in that alley. 
He said, I went home and told my dad, this nice gray haired man, he set the pins and he helped me with my shoes and he, and he poured my, uh, my uh, beverage for me. And uh, he said, my father said to me, that was William Duran who had founded General Motors. So Billy had a big dream. He was ahead of himself with the idea of bowling alleys, which became big very much later. But he suffered, suffered a stroke in 1942 at age 80, moved back to New York and was confined to his apartment. Again, uh, broke. Alfred Sloan asked three other colleagues on the GM board to help Duran out. C.S. Mott, remember, had moved his axle operation to Flint, Sam McLaughlin of GM of Canada, and John Thomas Smith, Billy's lawyer, who is now general counsel at GM. So every three months, one of these four sent a check for $2,500 to Billy's wife, Catherine, and that's what they lived on until his death in 1947. Durant died March 18, 1947, at age 85. It's buried in the Woodlawn Cemetery in Bronx, New York. On the 50th anniversary of GM in 1958, a marble slab monument was laid by the city of Flint, not General Motors, but the city of Flint, in a plaza in front of the Flint Cultural Center opposite the entrance to the Alfred P. Sloan Museum. It's the slab of cement with the two uh, flagpoles. And there's an inscription uh, that you can barely see here that's facing us, inscribed with the following. William Crapo Durant, 1861-1947, founder of General Motors, 1908. In the golden milestone year of the corporation, its proud birthplace dedicates this plaza in lasting appreciation of what his vision, genius, and courage contributed to his home city, and to the renown of American industry. Statues of Durant and Dort have been placed in the Carriagetown Historic District in Flint, near the historic Durant-Dort headquarters. Now, uh, I've got my own uh, Billy Durant uh, statue here. Uh, interesting story, uh, I gave a presentation, uh, an interactive presentation, where we had actors portraying Ford, Chrysler, and Durant to a bunch of GM employees from around the country several years ago. And the fellow that hired me was a uh, training director, and he came up to me afterwards. I portrayed uh, Billy Durant. And he had this statue, and he said, you know, uh, they gave me this at the 50th anniversary, and I'm not much into history, but you certainly are. Would you like it? Well, I said, thank you. And I put on my bookcase, and I had it there for about 10 years, and then when I put together this PowerPoint presentation, I looked up on my bookcase, and there was my Billy Durant statue. So uh, you got to be careful you don't throw away things that you uh, think you might not use again. Well, then Pierre, du Pierre DuPont headed up GM until 1923 when Alfred Sloan was made president. He then served as chairman from 37 to 56. And he's the one that is credited with professionalizing GM and growing it into the world's largest corporation. He set up a formal organization charts with decentralized operating divisions and central staff functions. So this greatly reduced the number of executives reporting directly to Sloan compared to the way it was under Billy Durant. And this structure became the um, map or the uh, way almost all American corporations organized themselves with line and staff uh, uh, groups. His book, My Years at General Motors, became a handbook of management principles. The Sloan School of Management at his alma mater, MIT, is named after him. Sloan was an organizer, but remember, without Billy Durant, there would have been nothing for him to organize. Harley Earl was the first professional automobile designer who led GM design efforts, which produced leading designs for the next 30 years, beginning with 1927 LaSalle, including the Corvette and tail fins of the 50s. He's shown here in 1938 in his Buick Y job, which was a prototype. The industry's first concept car featured hidden headlamps, electric windows, and flush door handles. It's now at the GM Design Center. Well, this is an interesting story, of course. GM headquarters is now at the Renaissance Center in downtown Detroit. The irony is that it was first 
built by Henry Ford II to spur the rebirth in downtown Detroit. So uh, imagine Henry would uh, Henry II would uh, uh, roll over in his grave if he knew that the uh, uh, logo on the building was was GM. The former GM building on West Grand Boulevard is now a state of Michigan office building, and yes, the letter D can still be seen on each corner. Well, Henry Ford was the icon pioneer that we all think of in the automobile industry. So here are some interesting similarities and differences between him and Billy Durant. Let's look at the similarities. They both viewed a positive automotive future. Uh, Billy uh, obviously uh, uh, left and uh, came back, left again, and even formed his own company. That's, that's being positive. Uh, Henry Ford, it took him three, two failures uh, before he finally founded his Ford Motor Company that exists today. So they were both very positive about the future. Uh, they both started in the automobile industry at around age 40. They both died in the same year in 1947, Ford at age 83, Durant at age 85. They were both fairly soft-spoken. They were both pushed out of their companies. This, um, we heard how Billy was, uh, brief story, Henry Ford, uh, after Edsel died, Henry came back into management. He was along in years, uh, was a bit stubborn. It was now a multinational company and uh, uh, the family was urging him to step down and he wouldn't. And uh, finally, Edsel's widow, Eleanor, uh, remembered that uh, he didn't want stockholders. And so she went to him and said, unless you step down, I'm going to sell my share of the stock uh, to the public and you will once again have stockholders. And so he finally decided to step down and that's when they brought Hank the Deuce or Henry II in at age 28. They weren't the best family men. There's a lot uh, we, we saw about uh, what happened with uh, Billy's uh, family and um, uh, Henry, a lot of criticism about uh, how Henry uh, uh, handled Edsel, uh, uh, a lot of conflict and uh, and undercut him and so forth. A pretty good, better grandfather, I think, than father uh, was Henry. Um, what about their differences? Well, Durant was a salesman, Ford was a tinkerer. Durant was flexible, Ford was stubborn. Durant delegated to others, although he sometimes second-guessed them. Ford was very authoritarian. Durant had an overly strong focus on the stock market in his life. And Henry had an overly strong focus on the Model T. Uh, he hung on to it uh, way after people in his company said, we need a new product to compete with the new Chevrolet and some of the changes being made. He said, with 50% of the market share, uh, the Model T is it. Um, and he lost his, his uh, uh, leadership in the industry uh, because of hanging on to Model T too long. Durant was in charge of GM for a total of six years, twice, uh, two years once and four years the other time. Ford was in charge of Ford for 42 years. Durant died penniless and Ford died wealthy. Um, let's take a look at the, um, some of their strengths. Durant built the first successful automobile corporation by pulling all these companies together. Ford had the first successful auto assembly line, which uh, let him cut his costs uh, way down from $950 to $260, and, and that's how he got 50% of the market share. Everybody else started uh, using the assembly line, but he, he got there first, and, and uh, it paid off. Durant was creative financially. Ford was creative technically. Durant was successful at organizing several companies into one. Ford was successful in starting one company and building it. He did acquire Lincoln uh, later on, but basically uh, the majority of it was, was one company. So what more can be said about Billy Durant, this dreamer who dreamt of a rapidly growing company consisting of the leading automobile manufacturers of his time and made his dream come true. In establishing what became the largest corporation in the world, he exceeded even his own dreams. A mere handful of people have been so fortunate throughout history. Well, I'd like to briefly tell you about uh, uh, some of my other uh, presentations.
here. Uh, oh, okay, I got these, uh, I made some changes here and I got them out of order. Uh, I'll come back to this one. Uh, I am Dor Doré Productions in Northville. I'd like to give some photo credits to Kettering University Archives, Sloan Museum, Detroit News. Uh, I have presentations on the other automotive pioneers, Henry Ford, Walter Chrysler, the four that didn't quite make it into the big three, Studebaker, Packard, Nash, and Hudson, the Dodge Brothers, uh, the America's classiest cars, Auburn, Cord, Duesenberg, and Stutz, all American cars, and got into aviation history with the Wright Brothers, uh, Bill Boeing and Donald Douglas. Then we have some interactive presentations, Henry and Friends, where we have actors portraying Ford, Edison, and Firestone, Another one with Ford, Durant, and Chrysler. And then I got involved in other leaders, uh, world leaders, Franklin Eleanor Roosevelt, Harry Best Truman, Joe and Rose Kennedy, and Mark Twain and his wife. Uh, there's uh, uh, Henry and Friends. Um, Thomas Edison on the left bears a strange resemblance to me. I would like to put in a plug for the Motor Cities National Heritage Area. I'm on the board of directors. We're an affiliate of the National Park Service with a charter to preserve the cultural and historic landscape associated with the automobile. On this website, MotorCities.org, uh, a lot of good information. You can go and sign up and every week uh, you'll get emailed a brand new article on automotive history. And uh, we do a lot of other things too. You might've seen the motor, you are now uh, entering the Motor Cities National Heritage Area highway signs that, uh, being put up uh, around the area. Uh, again, I'm in Northville. I have a, uh, the bottom uh, line here is my website, doreproductions.weebly.com. I post my schedule of public presentations there. So if you want to, uh, if you want to see any of my public presentations, I've got one, uh, one or two coming up with uh, Joe and Rose Kennedy talking about their family. And uh, so I'll leave that up and I think we have some questions and we have some time for some questions and answers. Justin, do we have a... Sorry about that, I double muted myself. Thank you for that, Mr. Doré. Uh, we do have some time for a short Q&A. Um, if you have questions, uh, please ask, put a question mark in the chat so I can ask you guys to unmute and so we don't have a flood. Uh, just so everyone knows, we will be trying to upload this uh, presentation on our website so that you can view it again at a later date as well. So does anyone have any questions? I guess I overwhelmed them with facts. Huh? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, Richard? I see Russ, uh, Russ, we appreciate the opportunity to come back to the Highland Activity Center as a presenter. Uh, we've enjoyed your uh, experience with Bess and uh, Mr. Truman. Uh, it was the last visit. Mark Twain, you've been there with us. Yeah. And with the Friends of Highland Recreation Area, you presented the Dodge Brothers. So I had a wide range of your presentations and appreciate your knowledge and presentation for everyone. And yeah, uh, regard to the the GM activity, we appreciate what you presented tonight. Thank you very much as a member of the board of the Highland Activity Center. Yeah, it's always a fun, a fun audience to present to there. Go ahead, Heidi, I see you wanna talk. Oh no, I was just trying to get on to say thank you if you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, I wanted to say thank you. I've always enjoyed your presentations and um, just thank you. Have a great day, sir, and hope to see you soon again. We do have a question in chat. Uh, Ms. Crawford was asking, if Durant was so financially wise, how on earth did he die broke? Uh, the stock market, he just, he just had this optimism uh, oh. that... Um, uh, the first time he, he really was concerned. He felt he had uh, encouraged people to invest and sold people on the company and that he better uh, uh, hold it up for a while, you know, and financially himself and uh, until it rebounded. Uh, and again, always the, um, always the optimist, <laughs> uh, the, the super salesman and, and uh, always convinced himself that, uh, that things would turn around. 
and um, uh, again, he he happened to get clobbered a couple times, uh, you know, by the market. And then I think his Durant Motors, by the time he started that, it was pretty hard to compete with Ford and GM. You know, it wasn't like another small company starting up, like when he started GM. The, these companies were established, and you had to really, um, really, really be a, a top top line to compete at that time with the existing GM and with Ford and Chrysler. And, uh, he, he just didn't pull that off. So, huh. Inter Interesting. Um, do we have any more questions for Mr. Dory? Russ, <laughs> Russ, your presentation on aviation, uh, I haven't seen that. Is that similarly an hour long or so? Yes. Is, uh -huh. that, yeah. a single, is that a single presentation or is that yeah, an actual presentation? like this, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, I got a couple more questions in chat. Uh, a gentleman or someone named Begok was asking, how did Durant gain his financial skills? Background? Uh, just kind of self-taught. You know, they, they started that buggy company and um, he... Um, they just, they made good products and they sold the heck out of them. And uh, he, um, he just, he just uh, was good at what he did. And, and again, remember in those days, there wasn't a lot of competition. If you were good, uh, made a good product at a good price, uh, there, weren't, there weren't a lot of, there wasn't a lot of competition and you could really, really take off. Um, and then, uh, but his market, you know, his dad was a stock speculator and didn't do very well. And uh, I'm not saying it's hereditary, but uh, he certainly, he certainly, uh, you know, didn't, didn't do well again in, in the market. So uh, he wasn't a very good investor. Uh, he was a good promoter. All right. Next question is from Carlin Parr. Uh, what a place to live during the start of the auto industry. You said that Billy lived in New York City. How did he manage GM from there? Uh, they, uh, they had an office there, uh, and, uh, you know, he would, uh, people would come to, to him or he would, uh, he would come to Detroit. Um, and by then it was, it was very large. He had a lot of people, you know, reporting to him. And, uh, uh, again, he didn't have very good management structure. So, uh, it was, <laughs> it was probably, uh, kind of loosey goosey compared to how it was under, uh, under Sloan. But uh, they managed, they managed. They had a big office there, as I recall. And it was an international company, too. So uh, it was, I had access to Europe. Interesting. Um, next question is from Brian Johnson. My great uncle was vice president with Billy. In your research, have you become familiar with the name Edwin O. Wood? Originally, Edwin formed a few fraternal orders, including an insurance company with Billy at a younger age. Little seems to be known of Edwin. No, no, I don't. Uh, there, there's a good book on, on Billy Durant, uh, at least one, the one I've used mostly. Uh, and I'd have to look back through it. Um, um, I do have a, uh, well, that was before he got into the, the business. Um, but it reminded me, I do have a, a stock certificate. I, somebody came to one of my presentations and they had an actual stock certificate. And I asked them if they could send me a copy and uh, I had it uh, put in uh, in plastic, but this is a Durant Motors stock certificate from uh, 1926 uh, with Durant Motors. But no, I, I, I have not heard of that, but uh, I could, you know, go to the library and, and get the, um, all right, here I got this. Uh, it's called Billy Durant, Creator of General Motors by Gustin, G-U-S-T-I-N. And, um, you know, that, that tells about his life. Maybe he mentions him in there. I know uh, he did have, uh, uh, did some insurance business. And uh, that was real early on. That's fascinating, isn't it, to find these relationships. All right, looks like we've got two more questions. Um, Mr. Johnson said thank you, by the way. But Ms. Crawford asks, were these men college educated? That would be a big deal in the 20s, don't you think? Yeah, no, they weren't. No, Billy, uh, Billy uh, uh, dropped out of school. Um, uh, and um, Walter Chrysler, 
uh, did some uh, did some uh, uh, extension. What do you call it? Uh, not online, but uh, uh, you know, when, when you when you got educated through the mail. I'm trying to think of the term to used to use. Uh, any anyway, and um, and Henry Ford. None of them were were uh, college educated, but again, because none of them were. Uh, and because again, this was all brand new, and and if, you know if you were good, good product, good prices, and good service, uh, there weren't many comp competitors. There were a lot of small companies, but if you if you really did things right, and uh, you could you could uh, learn on the job, so uh, and hire good people. All right. Um, next question is again from B. Gawk. Who bought? Who brought Hollywood, i.e., artistic design, into cars at GM? Uh, well, Harley Earl was was a designer. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by Hollywood. Uh, I think I'm thinking he's meaning um, more from the boxy to the more flashy looking cars, but maybe I'm wrong. Well, again, Harley Earl was a, it was a big design. Yeah, it was it was probably the one that uh, influenced that with the uh, with the streamlining, and uh, you know it kind of evolved from the fenders being separate to the fenders being part of the hood, and then getting more and more streamlined. Uh, one interesting thing is Walter Chrysler developed uh, one called the Aeroflow. <laughs> it was it was too far ahead. It was too streamlined. It wouldn't sell. So they redid the body to be more conventional looking and it sold fine. So it's a tough business. You have to be, uh, you have to be innovative, but you can't get too far out or, uh, or people won't accept it. Okay. Um, next is from Lisa Austin. Many of the auto founders contributed land one way or another to what is now the Michigan DNR, did Billy or his company donate or sell land to the state? Oh boy, I don't know. Um, I honestly don't. Um, yeah, I, I, I really, I really don't. He, he may have, but that's that's one of the things. You know, you do so much reading on these, and uh, and uh, certain things just get I, I get picked up and put in my presentation. Other things just kind of they're there and they're interesting, and they kind of fall by the wayside and. Uh, uh, I'd have to do some more looking, but I, I certainly don't, don't remember uh, anything about that. Uh, now, um, there, the Dodges uh, donated a lot of land for parks, as I recall, uh, but I can't remember about, uh, about GM. Okay, um, two quick things. Uh, one's a statement, one, then one more question, and we're going to wrap up for the evening. Uh, Brian Johnson had a statement, there is a Durant Park in Lansing dedicated to Billy during the time of the factory was producing cars just a couple miles away. The park remains open to this day. Um, uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I don't know when that park was opened. Um, there's a, a wonderful um, Olds Museum in, in Lansing. And um, did you say Lansing or Flint? Lansing. Lansing, yeah. And uh, there's a, there's a, there's an old uh, museum there, and has some Durant cars and things. And, uh, yeah, I don't know at what time, at what point Durant Park was uh, was named after him or where it came from. That'd be an interesting thing to know. Google it. <laughs> That's the the magic tool now. All right, and then the final question, um, Mr. Worthman asks, what about the GM building in New York? I uh, don't know much about that. Uh, I don't know what, I, I don't, I don't recall it being, you know, one of the more famous buildings, the Chrysler building is, uh, although that was not owned by the Chrysler company, that was owned by Walter as a separate business for his sons. But, uh, but it's, it's, you know, pretty well known, but I, I don't recall the GM building being a, uh, a major well-known building in, in New York. I don't know. That'd be interesting. Maybe maybe they just, uh, I don't know if they had their own building or if they leased uh, space in you know, somebody else's building or, or how that worked. 
there's always always more to learn. That's what's fun. Okay, um, it looks like all of the questions. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Dory. We appreciate your presentation. It was very entertaining and enlightening. Well, thank you. And uh, if any of you are interested in the in the Kennedy family, uh, go to my website. Uh, I've got a couple of public uh, Zoom presentations coming up on the um, on Joe and Rose Kennedy, where they talk about JFK and Bobby and Teddy and and all of the family. Kind of fascinating, and it's an interactive Zoom with me portraying Joe Kennedy and uh, actress portraying his wife. So that's that's always fun. It's coming up sometime soon. <laughs> thank you. All for, right. Thank you for inviting me. Always fun to be here. All right, everyone. Thank, thank you, you for attending, and uh, we hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thank you again, Mr. Dore, okay. and we hope you have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you.